Hello out there, fellow YouTubians. Very sorry again for my uh, two-week hiatus. The uh, family matters have been taken care of. I've recovered. I have a new granddaughter that I'll be naming when I'm called up to the Torah on Saturday. And... And now, for yet another Yiddish lesson. Also some very good news. We are very close to having our YouTube channel monetized, which means for you, you'll have to sit through annoying advertisements and banners and pop-ups and God knows what else, but I'll see what I can do to keep them to a minimum. And please click on these things and buy them. That's how we get paid. Uh, or don't buy them, but just click on them. Anyway, a very wise friend of mine has left a remark on uh, our YouTube channel uh, or on LinkedIn, I'm not sure which advising me to, number one, look directly at the screen. Number two, to get a whiteboard and write on them. Looking directly at the screen would be wonderful, except that I have to look at the cue cards, which have the list of words, because occasionally, as you must have noticed, my memory fails me and I need a reminder. But I have solved the problem of that, plus the fact that I don't have a whiteboard and can't go out and don't even know where to buy one. That both of them at once. I have a printer and the printer can print in portrait or landscape. And if I print it in landscape, it is then possible to put it right in front of me and you won't be any the wiser because my only camera, at least at this time, is the integral camera in my laptop. But as, uh, but I'm holding up the cue cards right now in front of the screen of the laptop, and it's still taking my picture, as I can see, because it's very bright and the top of my head is showing through. So, then, instead of a whiteboard, which I don't have and right now can't get, I can turn it around and show you what I'm cue, uh, cue carding off of. And that way you get to see the writing, get used to the Yiddish phonetics as well. And I won't have to be sitting there saying, excuse me, you're gonna write, whoops, I wrote it up backwards. Oh, no, 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 forget that. Okay, let me try it again. And waste everybody's time and, uh, and perhaps provoke a bit of ridicule. And uh, I don't like to be ridiculed even by people I can't see. Anyway, let's get on with the, the long-awaited Lesson 10. We're still dealing with the diminutive. We introduced to you the first kind of diminutive, which is just a lamed added at the end of a word such as a, uh, instead of a tish, a table, you say a tishel, and the plural of that is tishlach. A fire is a firel, and the plural is firelach, and uh, so on and so forth. Now, we're going to get to some exceptions to uh, the uh, morphology of the first diminutive. One is with letters that end with a nun, such as stein, which means a, st a stone. Plural of that would be steiner. But the diminutive would not be steinel, because uh, that just is hard to pronounce. It would be, uh, we would add a dalet on, at the end, which would be steindel. And the plural would be steindlach. And Likewise, 
a shrill cry is a gavine, which uh, I suppose the plural would be gaviner, and diminutive is gavingel, and plural would be gavindlach. And then we go to the consonant uh, ending lamet. That, of course, presents problems. If you, if you try to add a lamet to a lamet, it just sounds like you're having trouble getting around the first lamet, and maybe somebody should give you the Heimlich maneuver. Uh, so, here's an example. This will show you what to do with that. A mouth is a moil. And uh, the uh, diminutive of it would not be moilala, it would be moilacho. You had a sego and a chaf, or, uh, and the plural of that would be mailachlach. Moil, mailacho, mailachlach. Likewise, you could also have a, a, uh, a uh, word where it doesn't change, such as a shul, which is like a uh, a uh, local synagogue. Plural of uh, the uh, diminutive of that w would be shulecho or shilecho, and plural shulechlach or shilechlach. And here I'll show you now the chart. You can see it and read it. Okay, Stein, Steindl, Steindlach, as opposed to Steinder, I mean Steiner. Gewein, Geweindl, and Geweindlach. Uh, there's still bugs in this. Maybe if I could uh, get some uh, clear plastic, but I can't. I don't have that right now. But I could. I could probably get that. Anyway, likewise, moyo, mylecho, mylechlach, shul, shulech, uh, and shulechlach. There's a lot. I'll try to cover the next one more uh, quickly. Then there is the Semitic plural diminutive. That is, you remember that there are uh, Hebrew words in Yiddish, and the plural of uh, the masculine nouns is, as it is in Hebrew, ganovim. And how do you say the diminutive plural of ganovim? You don't say ganovlach. You would say ganovimlach. So you have like a double plural. Likewise, talmidim, students. It's not talmidlach. It would be talmidimlach. And likewise, you have the honorific title and uh, the uh, ironic title. For example, a doctor in the plural would be doktorim. Because they have a lot of respect for a doctor and a lot of respect for Hebrew. Yiddish speakers give it a, a Hebrew plural, even though it's a uh, German uh, root. And uh, the, it's very consistent because instead of doktorimlach, it would be doktorimlach in the in the plural diminutive, and likewise when you're dealing with the ironic honorific, and you want to make it uh, diminutive, froyerim is stooges. Froyerimlach is the diminutive plural for for stooges. So the three stooges would be die drei Freudemlach. And here you are again. Here, I'll just hold it up because uh, I confuse myself and you when I try to point at these things 
without being able to see them, because I either move it so that you can't see it, or I have to play guessing games, which is no good either. Perhaps when I become more tech-savvy, I'll uh, find a way to make the cursor do the pointing for me after it's already a video. Okay, there are nouns without any first diminutive. For example, nouns that end with a lamed, like a leffel or a guppel. You just can't go leffel or guppel, so you don't do first diminutive. And then there is also uh, nouns with with uh, one or more unstressed syllables at the end, such as an unchickenish, which is a, 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 another way of saying a very boring, tedious person. Uh, something like a nudnik, but with shades of meaning. Can't do first uh, diminutive with that. And likewise, nouns that end with a vowel, such as cholera, which means a disease, and uh, or 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 just an affliction, somebody you'd rather be away from, you call them a cholera. So there are except uh, there are an exception to this last rule, sort of, because. You can do a first diminutive of a proper name, but it isn't exactly the same as the first diminutive because instead of just a lamid consonant, you also put an ayin at the end of it, or at least that's the way it's always been to my ex experience. For example, yoshkila. Uh, that's like little, uh, little yoshka. Moishala or yeshuala. You wouldn't say Yoshkel or Moshel or Yeshuel. You would do that with a uh, with uh, a non-vowel ending proper name. Uh, for example, people who knew me when I was younger would call me Davidl. But uh, but it's awkward when you have a vowel to do that. It just uh, it sounds unbalanced. Here is this, that cue card that I read off of. And next we go to the second diminutive. Unfortunately, I won't be able to some, uh, get through the diminutive today and get back to finishing off plurals and uh, then on to adjectives and case endings on nouns and other interesting stuff. But we're going to get as close as we can to it. Okay, the second diminutive is more than just a empty consonant. It's a, seg a segel. I mean, I'm sorry, a, 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 an ayin, a lamid, and an ayin. An ayin, which makes the segel sound in Yiddish. In other words, ele, uh, mir, and then the plural, that is elach. So, a mir tish is, in plural, tishin. A diminutive tish, a little tish, is a tishel. That's the first diminutive, and the plural of that would be tishlach. And the... Uh, the second diminutive, instead of just a mere little table, an itty bitty witty table, is a tishala, which the plural of that would be tishalach. So I wonder, is Count Dracula in the diminutive? The second diminutive? An interesting thought. Or a cuts is a cat. Plural would be cutsin. The, uh, the diminutive. The first diminutive of cat is quetzal, which is a little bit of a vowel change. And the plural of that is quetzlach. And the 
diminutive for pretty witty witty kitty would be Ketzela. And the plural of that is Ketzelach. Perhaps you heard the Golem tape narrated, narrat, narrated by Leonard Nimoy before his death, many years before it. It was t Tales of the Golem uh, and the Maharal of Prague. And in one of the stories, there is a Gentile helper in a tannery called Ketzela, which means pretty cute little kit kitten because he jumped around and he came to a bad end. And they tried to pin a blood libel on the uh, Jewish community. Uh, but anyway, at the, in the false account of it given by his brothers, everybody was getting Ketzela drunk so that they could kill him and use his blood to make matzah. And they were saying, L'chaim Ketzela, L'chaim. So there you have an example of the second diminutive in popular culture. If you haven't heard that tape, I suggest that you do. Most people only know Leonard Nimoy as his main uh, as his main character, Doctor Spock in, Dar in Star Trek. But uh, here you see him in a different character as the son-in-law of the Maharal of Prague, telling the tales of his adventures with the Golem to his son. Anyway. So, a buch diminutive is bichel, and second diminutive is bichel, a tiny little book. And likewise, you have in the plural, a buch is bichel. Just like in the diminutive, you change it from a u to a i sound. And the plural of that is bichlach. And the second diminutive of that is bichlach. A lot of little witty, witty, bitty books. And here you go. Here is the uh, the cue card that I just used. I'm just experimenting to see if it goes blank when something is right up against it. I sure hope not. I like to, people to see my face. It's not much of a face, but it's mine. Okay, now you'll recall I said that uh, that uh, uh, nouns that end with a lamid cannot have a first diminutive, but they can certainly have a second diminutive because that's perfectly pronounceable. And the way that you pronounce it is by taking the lamid at the end, putting a a ayin in the middle, so instead of a lefel, meaning a uh, a spoon, you have a lefela, a little tiny spoon. And the plural of a plain spoon is leflin, and the second diminutive is lefelach. And likewise, a fork is a gopel, and the second diminutive of it is gopola which would have to do for the meaning of the first diminutive too. So uh, forks don't get no respect. And the plural of guffle, guffle to, to review it would be guplin. Sort of like Janis Joplin, except with a gimel instead of a J sound, which doesn't exist in indigenous Hebrew or Yiddish. And the plural diminutive would be guppelach. A uh, schlissel is a, uh, is a key. We met that before, and you'll recall that in the, normal, uh, uh, in the normal course of things, you can say either schlisslin for plural of key or schlisslach, using the diminutive plural, even if you don't mean diminutive. But if you want to have diminutive, since it ends with a lamid, it has to be schlissela. It can't be schlissel, because that just doesn't sound right. So schlissela would be first and second diminutive in meaning, but in actual fact, it's a, the second diminutive. And uh, the plural, of course, would be schlisselach instead of schlisslach, as it would be with a plain key. So if someone's insulting your key, 
You'll know by the way they do the plural of it. Now to clarify, diminutive is not always meant as an insult. It could be, like uh, if you're uh, getting into a fight with someone at the local Kretschme and you want to you want to make him feel uh, feel slighted so that he'll take the first swing. You yeah, his name is Moshe. You say, "Kleine Moshe," and uh, uh, if you want to add uh, more to it, will be "Kleine Moshe hat nit kein Steiner." Little Moshe doesn't have any balls. Okay, but enough of that. Don't use it to get into fights. Use it to talk about, to talk affectionately to your grandchildren, or to describe your furniture as a tish or a, or a tishel or a tishela, as you as you prefer. But it can be used for fighting. It can be used for for showing affection, or it can be used simply to describe uh, an object. As something uh, as somewhat uh, dear to you or small or such like. Now we have unstressed. Am I looking at the camera, folks? Uh, unstressed vowel endings. I see the screen did not go blank. I peeked. Unstressed vowel endings. Like I said, you can't do a first diminutive with it, but the second diminutive is hate. For example, a frage means a question. And uh, the unstressed, and because it's unstressed, you can't do first diminutive, so you have to do second diminutive. It's a fragile. And the plural non diminutive would be frages. And uh, the diminutive will be fragalach. A gemora is the Talmud with the uh, with the elaborate discussion of the uh, very condensed text of the Mishnah. It's called the gemora. And if uh, you want to say it's a little gemora, or an insignificant gemora, or a very uh, precious gemora, you'd say a gemorala. And the plural again, gemoras non diminutive, gemoralach uh, diminutive. And here is that. Take a good gander. Let me know in the comments if I'm to whisking these away too long or keeping them until you in front of you until you get bored. This is a new system. And it was suggested to me if you must know. Uh, well, I, maybe he doesn't want me to say who it is. So I have to be careful of his feelings. Uh, okay. There are, just like there are nouns with no first diminutive, there are sound nouns with no... Uh, second diminutive, but there is a first diminutive. For example, these, these, uh, the word for a nephew, which is borrowed from Slavic and ends with a kuf, is a flemenic. You can't do a, dimin a diminutive on that. Because uh, then you have to change the stress. It's flemenic. You stress the second syllable, and to, me, to add a illa at the end, you'd have to make it flaminicola, which doesn't sound right, okay? Because the Slavic words, you have to be careful about uh, which syllable is stressed. And the f But the first diminutive of that is pretty simple, flaminical, my little nephew. Uh, and the plural is flamenicus. You remember that Slavic plural that end with a kuf uh, is always s instead of uh, just a samech, a sound. 
And the uh, diminutive plural is flaminiclach. There you are. Take a good gander. A lot on this page. Okay, then there is nouns that end with a lamid that have no first diminutive as aforementioned, but do have a second diminutive. So here we are. For example, a fiddle is is for, uh, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm getting confused here. Comes with old age, even though I'm not quite old, I'm not quite young either. Okay. First, it's my cue card. Then it's your whiteboard. Yeah, fiddle is a uh, violin, of course, uh, and. The, plur uh, the diminutive is fiddler. In the plural in the non diminutive is fiddlin. And the, uh, pl uh, uh, the plural diminutive, fiddler. There is also. There is one. No, uh, noun that I know which has only the first diminutive, never the second diminutive, a ninicle, which means a grandson. There is no non-diminutive or second diminutive for that. Every time you talk about a grandson, it's einicle, and the plural of that is einiklach. Uh, okay, then there is nouns that end with a nun, which almost never have a uh, second diminutive, but there is a uh, one important exception, a stecken, which means a stick. It has a verbal form too, but let's just deal with the noun here. A stecken is a stick. In the diminutive, you drop the nun. With every diminutive which has a nun ending uh, and ha still has a diminutive, that's what you do. For example, the first diminutive of stick is steckel. The second is steckele. And the uh, plural is steckenus, my dictionary assures me. And uh, the, uh, the diminutive would be steckloch and steckeloch respectively. Okay. Here it is for you. Let me know if I'm holding it too close, too far, too long, too short. Put it in the comments. And I very much thank the men who uh, told me to uh, attempt to do it with, with a whiteboard and looking directly at the camera because it seems to be working out, although I still got to work a few kinks out of it. Okay, now you have inanimate objects with a ke ending. That's a different way of doing the, the, the uh, diminutive. And it has different rules because you can't take a normal noun and change it into a noun with ke ending. It has a completely different meaning. Uh, what is an agrafke again? Uh, safety pin, yes. Such as an agrafke. That means a safety pin. Uh, there is no such a noun as an agraf, meaning a real big pin or a tent pin. It's just an agrafke, which means a safety pin. A cassette is a cassette. 
likewise. And there is no non-diminutive form of that. And the plural of them is the, the same. I have, if you have a niece that you call, uh, whose name is Reza, you would, I'm talking hypothetical here, you would call uh, her in the diminutive Rezke. But I don't think that that uh, applies to every proper name. Because uh, if you had another niece whose name is Rivka, that would be Rivkala. So, go figure. I don't know the rules confidently enough to say how it goes. But at any rate, there are there are nouns that can be my, that can be made into totally new semi-related nouns uh, by adding the ke ending, such as machine, uh, which is the root of the of uh, the word schreiber machine ke, which means typewriter schreiber machine ke. And these are not so familiar to me. Let me just peek. Or a gizmo is called a machreike, from the word, from the verb mach to make. And here at last is the uh, is uh, the uh, the white sheet, which will show you. All that I've just said. Perhaps if I get a new toner cartridge, it'll show through the other end, and then I just gotta get used to reading it in reverse. I can see through here now, now that I don't have a bunch of other uh, sheets in front of me, and maybe that will be how it works. At any rate, I'm very glad to be back. I made the lesson extra wrong, long here. Wrong. <laughs> yes, I always make mistakes. So I made it extra long here to make up for lost time. And I will try not to have gaps in the lessons, especially since we're about to be monetized. As for the artwork that I'm selling, I have been advised that we have to clear some legal hurdles before we can present it on the internet, either on a website or my YouTube channel. So it'll be back hopefully next week or the week after, after we clear up the legal hurdles. Thank you and a pleasant evening to you all. I hope I'll get back on track soon with making Hebrew subtitles. The poor Hebrew speakers want to learn Yiddish too or at least some of them do. There are, of course, hardcore Zionists who thoroughly curse the Yiddish language and then jump up and down on it and scream. But I'm not, a, I'm not of them. It's a beautifully warm language and it has a rich literature and a, and a uh, rich place in Jewish history, as I've said many times. Good night. God bless you all.